I was in uh, Hamilton three years ago in the same room. This was just in the wake of the war in Yugoslavia. And as you recall, uh, many people, including people in progressive organizations, supported that war. In part, I think it had to do with a lack of understanding, but again, we, we, we were caught up in what, was, what we thought was a humanitarian war to liberate the, the Kosovars from the dictatorship of, uh, of uh, Slobodan Milosevic. But I think when we look at the history of this entire period starting, in fact, starting in the early 90s, we understand that this is part of a war agenda, and there are several stages in this war agenda. Certainly, Yugoslavia was one stage, and Yugoslavia was very important as a step stone into this particular, into the Afghan as well as into the Iraqi war for political, geopolitical, economic, strategic regions, uh, reasons. We know also that the Balkans is, is, a, is an important corridor for pipelines, uh, for transportation. It is the gateway into the Middle East. But if you, if you look at national security documents, you realize that all these wars are part of the same they're part of the same design. They're part of the same... Uh, uh, they, they emanate from the same military doctrine. And uh, this is now abundantly clear when we look at what is called the project for the new American century, which is this blueprint of, dom of global domination, uh, which uh, was published before the accession of Bush to the White House, uh, it is essentially a blueprint. It identifies the stages of this war. Um, if we look at national security doc documents going back to the, to the Clinton administration, we have evidence that the war in Iraq was already planned. The Central Command documents, uh, which are part of the of military strategy, which say very explicitly, Iraq is first, then Iran, extending from the tip of Saudi Arabia up to the Caspian Sea Basin. You have a region which encompasses approximately 70% of the world's supplies of oil and natural gas. Saudi Arabia, 26%. Iraq, 11% of total world reserves. That is five times those of the United States. And this ultimately is the objective of this war. It is to secure access, control, and ownership over these reserves. It's not the only objective, but it, it is certainly a key objective. And this region is strategic. And it's not only Iraq, it's the, it's the broader region. Now, if you look at, at this region, you'll notice that it is heavily militarized in the sense that each of these little planes indicates a U.S. military presence. Since the war in Yugoslavia, specifically 1999, with the, the outbreak of the, of the air campaign, uh, NATO signed an agreement with several former Soviet republics, which is called the Guam, Georgia, um, Ukraine, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, and Moldova. 
explicitly this military agreement was to protect and secure oil pipelines from the Caspian Sea Basin back to, uh, to, mar to Western markets. And in fact, in very important to understand that these, these pipeline routes, they transit, well, they transit across uh, uh, the, the Caucasus and then they, they also transit across the Balkans which is also a pipeline project controlled by the same multinational, uh, multinational companies. And, and there you can see that, that um, the civil war which broke out in Macedonia in, in late 2001 was instigated actually by, uh, by, uh, by the CIA and by the US military using, always using Al-Qaeda as, uh, as an instrument, as an intelligence asset to create uh, conditions of, which ultimately lead to the destabilization of, of these countries. Which, and one group of countries which is very important is Macedonia, Bulgaria, and Albania. And in the case of Macedonia, we know now for a fact that not only had you senior military advisors working with Islamic terrorists, um, uh, with, uh, w which, which were integrated into the, into the KLA. In other words, there was a, a direct collaboration between, uh, between the U.S. military on the one hand and the, uh, and the, the Mujahideen financed by Al-Qaeda on the other. And it is amply documented that this collaboration took place. So we, we see that and I, I'll try to go through several of the, of the, of the stages of this, of this process. We see that on the one hand, uh, the war uh, is based on securing oil. It's based on securing um, control over people and institutions. It is uh, also based, there's also a rivalry between the Anglo-American coalition on the one hand and uh, what the U.S. media has called Old Europe, which is the alliance, but essentially the alliance between France and Germany. Um, and that confrontation is not in any way limited to the arena of diplomacy, to the Security Council of the United Nations. It's a much deeper division, which has to do with the fact that there's that the oil industry is split down the middle with the Anglo-American conglomerates on the one hand. British Petroleum now is integrated into the U.S. oil industry with the, with the merger of British Petroleum and Amoco. Uh, and then you have the giant uh, um, uh, Franco-Belgian conglomerate, uh, Total Fina Elf, uh, which uh, is competing for markets in this region, which is also supported by Germany. You have the Russian oil conglomerates. In other words, what, we're, what we are looking at is a big divide. It's, it's the confrontation between great powers in the areas of, of, uh, of oil, uh, but not exclusively. It is also in the, in the military-industrial complex, where you have now... Uh, an integration of British uh, defense interests with those of the United States. And this explains the, the relationship between the two governments. It, it has nothing to do with Tony Blair or, or George W. Okay? It has to do with the fact that British aerospace systems is now part of the U.S. Uh, defense procurement system. Okay? It has exactly the same privileges as the big five, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and so on. Okay? So essentially we're dealing with the big six. So there's an integration at the level of defense production. There's an integration in the oil industry. There's, a, there's consultations and integration at the level of, of the military and the intelligence with the MI5, MI6 collaborating with their counterparts and so on. So that is what, what creates this, this military coalition. And very crucial, it is also the confrontation between competing monetary systems, namely the confrontation between the almighty U.S. dollar uh, on the one hand 
and uh, the uh, new global currency, which is the euro. Uh, this confrontation uh, for control over currency systems is something uh, which is very important, particularly in this region. The United States wants to ensure that the euro, as a new global currency, dominated by the large German banks, the, the Deutsche, the, the West uh, Deutsche Landsbank, the Deutsche Bank, the big French and Italian, a uh, handful of European banks, with essentially the, 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 the European Central Bank located in Frankfurt is, is a project of the German financial establishment. And uh, uh, so that you have a clash in the oil industry, you ha have a clash in financial institutions. It's very complex. There are lots of overlapping and cross-cutting allegiances. And then you have this split in the, in the defense industry where you have British aerospace systems integrated with the big five uh, defense contractors. Incidentally, Canada is part of that through the, the defense agreements and, and production sharing arrangements between the two countries. And then you have in Europe uh, uh, what is called the European Air Defense System Corporation, EADES, which is the which is the integration of Aerospatial Matra, uh, the, French, uh, um, the French conglomerate on the one hand, and Deutsche Aerospace, which is uh, a subsidiary of, of the powerful Daimler Group. And this has formed a very co powerful competing uh, uh, defense conglomerate, which does not have access to the US system of procurement, and therefore, there's also competition in the production of weaponry. So you have essentially, I mean, these are not the, 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 all the sectors in which there's, there's conflict between the two, these two uh, economic blocks, but defense industry, oil, and currency systems are the main ones. And, um, and the, this hidden war between, particularly the hidden war between the United States and France is something which goes back uh, to the early 90s, it's certainly visible, uh, although it's not reported in the media, in Central Africa, in the Rwandan Civil War, in the Congo, but also in West Africa, and it involves the confrontation of, of the old colonial powers, particularly France in this case, because Britain is allied with the United States, and the United States, which is establishing itself a colonial empire in Africa, um, using, again, uh, triggering civil wars through, through covert operations and so on. All these things in, have been documented and studied, uh, but they're not well understood and they're not discussed in the newspapers. So that we are dealing with a blueprint for global economic political domination. Uh, this region, as I mentioned, is, is strategic. Afghanistan has a border with with China. Afghanistan is now heavily militarized. Several of the former Soviet republics bordering onto, because it borders onto China, China's western frontier. Similarly, in recent years, there's been a militarization of the Chi South China Sea. The ultimate uh, rogue enemies are China and Russia. It's no secret to anybody in the military intelligence community in February of 2002, the United States uh, issued what was called its Nuclear Posture Review. And the Nuclear Posture Review was a redefinition of its nuclear policy. And it says we are now going to use nuclear weapons on a preemptive basis to protect ourselves against the rogue enemies. And they actually listed in, in the in the statement of this nuclear posture review, they listed, of course, the well-known rogue enemies, the rogue states, uh, Iran, Iraq, Syria, uh, North Korea, uh, Libya, but they also, they also included Russia and China, okay, as uh, stating very clearly that, that, nuclear, uh, that nuclear weapons are, are directed, uh, nuclear warheads are directed to these uh, uh, to these countries which 
in principle, are supposed to be friends of, of, of America, at least officially. Now, uh, uh, another important development, another important development in, the, in, the, in this nuclear posture review uh, happened on the, on the 6th of August uh, 2003, which happens to be Hiroshima Day, 58 years ago. Um, a secret meeting was held at the Offhut um, Central Command Base in Nebraska, which is uh, really the, you know, the big sort of uh, military base. They invited representatives from the private sector, Wall Street, etc., to discuss the development of nuclear weapons for uh, preemptive use. And there's been a whole propaganda campaign which has been launched already even before the war in Iraq uh, and uh, that uh, nuclear, that the new generation of tactical nuclear weapons, the so-called mini-nukes, are harmless to civilians, etc., because the explosion is underground, etc. No discussion of radiation effects of these nuclear warheads. The mini-nukes, the so they, look, they sound like harmless toys, but they have... They have uh, an explosive capacity which varies between one-third to six times uh, a Hiroshima bomb. And they are to be used in theater warfare, okay, alongside conventional weapons. Their delivery system is similar to, to that of these so-called bunker buster bombs. And uh, it, it's interesting, if you read the press carefully, you will have noticed that barely a a barely a couple of weeks before President Bush's famous uh, State of the Union address, which was back in February of this year, a White House spokesman said, we, do, we will not hesitate to use nuclear weapons if we are attacked with weapons of mass destruction. Okay? That was an official statement of the White House. Now, what's his name? Um, the, the, the British... Um, um, Minister of Defense, uh, what's his name? Hoon, uh, Hoon yes, Hoon. Hoon made the same statement, made exactly the same statement to the House of Commons uh, prior to the war in Iraq, but his statement was much more explicit and, and, and even more, more frightening because he said, we will not hesitate to use our trident nuclear weapons if we are attacked with weapons of mass destruction, knowing, of course, that the weapons of mass destruction were non-existent, okay? Uh, because, after all, that intelligence was known at the time, and we knew it, and everybody else knew it, okay? But the fact of the matter is that nuclear war is part of the... is, is a military assumption. It is now being uh, developed. Uh, it, uh, it, has this, it is being developed with the private sector, because there's money to be made in that, of course, um, uh, we, we also have, if you look at this, uh, at this broader region, uh, you, you also come to realize that we're not strictly talking about uh, the nuclear capabilities of, of Britain or the United States, which, I, which in, a, in any event constitute the main threat. But we're talking about Israel which, for the record, in fact, is more advanced than Britain. It's the fifth nuclear power in the world today, not officially, but in terms of scientific, uh, the scientific assessments of, of their capabilities and, and sophistication is that they're more advanced than Britain uh, in, in, uh, in their nuclear technology, and all of the Israeli warheads are pointed to cities in the Middle East as well as, as, well as Russia. Okay? And so we have here uh, a situation where the, the war, well, the war has extended from Afghanistan to Iraq, and, and now uh, one is hint, hinting that the next stage is Iran, and already, I mean, it's already included in the blueprint of the PNAC, because the, the, the PNAC says very explicitly, the PNAC's objective is to, quote, fight and decisively win in multiple simultaneous theater wars. This as a means to achieve the objective of Pax Americana. 
The war agenda does not stop with Iraq. Uh, it is part of a, of a continuous process. It is a project of world domination. There's no question about it. And it ultimately, it ultimately targets uh, China and Russia. It also, in a, in a sense, also targets the European Union. At least it, 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 its objective is to gain uh, economic and political dominance uh, in relation to competing, uh, uh, to competing world powers. So that, I mean, in history this kind of situation has, has emerges. Uh, it's a confrontation between competing uh, empires and I think we have to understand it in that particular way. Uh, and, and that's why I, I try to, to look at it in terms of, of, the, of the, the various uh, underlying objectives of this war, which is petroleum. Uh, it, it's clear that anybody who gains control over 70% of the world supplies of oil has a tremendous uh, leverage in relation to any other competing economic power in the world. Okay? And, uh, but, and, and that is certainly one of the, of the objectives of, of this war. Now, this, all, these, all this is happening at a period of, at a, at a very important juncture in, in our history. It's, it's certainly the most severe economic, political, and social crisis of the modern era. There's no question about that. Uh, it, is, it is accompanied by a major collapse in living standards all over the world, a globalization of poverty, which is not due to scarcity of resources, lack of means, precisely, precisely the opposite. It's, it's expansion through destruction. It's the displacement of, of uh, national economies, local economies, uh, through uh, deregulation, privatization, and so on. Okay? And now, if, for those of you who have followed the Iraqi privatization program, uh, which has emerged from one day to the next, I think it's very important to, to stress that. Um, everything is privatized with 100% ownership except oil, okay? except natural resources. But that includes banking, it includes services, education, health, etc., uh, it is no longer uh, something which is negotiated with the IMF. Okay? We, we might one day feel very nostalgic um, in relation to the IMF's deadly economic medicine, which uh, was imposed on countries, negotiated and imposed on countries in a multilateral framework. We're not dealing with that. We're not dealing with the World Trade Organization. We're dealing with... Uh, a finance minister and a minister of trade of Iraq, which emerged from one day to the next, okay? And who then go off to Dubai to a World Bank meeting, and then the following week they're off to the OPEC meetings representing Iraq, when we know for a fact that these people are stooges of, of, of the United States. And, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're instruments of the United States military intelligence apparatus. Um, and, uh, uh, but on the other hand, the, the type of, of arrangement which is now being put in place in Iraq is not a multilateral type of thing where you have creditors coming in with the World Bank and so on. It is a colonial structure where, it, where the, the U.S. government and the U.S. Treasury will, will, will set the stage for how the economy is going to be revamped and in fact, it's interesting in this particular context that uh, a spokesman of, for the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, uh, actually said, well, they weren't, even, they weren't even informed of this privatization program until it was announced, okay? Which suggests that, that uh, America is not consulting its partner in the coalition uh, which is technically uh, involved in this, in this uh, provisional, uh, in this coalition pr provisional authority, the, the so-called CPA, which is the body which administers Iraq. And, uh, uh, it, it appears that Britain, in this case, was not uh, was not informed. 
an unfolding economic crisis uh, within our own economies, which is triggered by the massive redirection of resources to the military-industrial complex and the war economy. Um, we, we can see it happening. There's a run on the dollar. Uh, we, uh, we, we can see the tremendous shift from civilian sec from the civilian sectors into the military. The, the, the implications of this of this uh, war economy on social, on social services is, is likely to be absolutely devastating. Uh, we, we can see also massive budget deficits accumulating due to the, uh, to, due to the expansion of military budgets. Uh, and uh, contrary to the 1930s, because I think we have to also start comparing with other, uh, comparing this situation with that of the 1930s in Germany. Okay? This is a movement towards fascism. It's a slide towards fascism. It is supported on the it's milita militarization on the outside, internationally. Inside, it is the establishment of the police state. Uh, under the Patriot legislation. Uh, this police state apparatus is unfolding, um, and uh, in fact, what you have is the militarization of civilian institutions. Uh, we brought out a very interesting study in the, in the magazine, which has to do with the fact that in the United States, they're repealing legislation which prevents the military from entering into the spheres of civilian police and justice. It's called the Posse Comitatus Act. It goes back to the Civil War. It's a very fundamental principle that the Pentagon, that the military do not intervene in, in, in police functions or in, uh, in the judicial. And what is happening is that this legislation is being repealed and we are now seeing the militarization of civilian institutions. So that de facto we have we have a military government in the United States, let's face it, because George W. is not the person who is pulling the strings. His understanding of foreign policy is very limited. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what the standards are in, in, at McMaster University, but I, I guess they're the same as they are at the U of O, but um, well, maybe higher. But in any event, uh, George W. would not have made uh, his uh, honors uh, BA in, in international affairs at, at any Canadian university with this kind of perspective. That's the, the, the guy does not know where Afghanistan is. Okay? And he is briefed on a daily basis by CIA director George Tenet. We talk about political puppets. Well, we have... We have these public relations puppets, and, and quite frankly, I prefer George W. to Wesley Clark, okay? I mean, if, if I had to choose, if, if it ever came down to that, because Wesley Clark is actually a very much more astute military man which, uh, who is responsible for war crimes in the, in, in, the, in the Balkans, for having ordered the destruction of civilian, civilian infrastructure, hospitals, schools, we, we have it well documented that Wesley Clark is, is a war criminal and George W. is just a puppet. Now, how does all this relate to September 11? Okay. Well, it relates in a very direct way because in every political statement by the Bush administration, 9-11 is, is the justification for waging these wars. It's the, it's the war on terror. And the war on terror is part of the national security doctrine. And the war on terror, the campaign against, the military campaign against Afghanistan was decided on the evening of 
on September 11, at 11 o'clock at night, they had decided to wage war on Afghanistan, and the justification and the pretext was that Al-Qaeda had attacked the World Trade Center. If you go through the documents and the, and the chronology discussed in my book, where I provide the a review of the meetings which were held on that, on that evening, that decision was made, was probably made several years before, because you don't simply improvise the war in Afghanistan from one month to the next, okay? But let's say that the, the, it was made public uh, on September 11, or at least in the morning papers of September 12, and it was, and the, and the, and the news dispatches were sent out mythical figure of uh, Osama bin Laden. Everybody says Al-Qaeda is behind these terrorist attacks. And there's a lot of discussion as to whether Al-Qaeda is behind these terrorist attacks. I won't necessarily get into that. But I think what must be understood is that Al-Qaeda is not an outside enemy, okay? Al-Qaeda is a creation of U.S. foreign policy. And is what the CIA calls an intelligence asset. The Al-Qaeda, which means the, the base, or the the origins of Al-Qaeda go back to the Soviet-Afghan war. It was a CIA initiative to recruit Islamic brigades, setting up the madrasas, the, in other words, the Quranic schools, the training camps in Afghanistan in the context of the Soviet-Afghan war. This was a Cold War initiative. It was launched under the presidency of Jimmy Carter, for which he got the Nobel Prize. Okay? <laughs> now, um, you might say, so in other words, Jimmy Carter, the Carter administration launched a secret operation. The National Security Advisor was Brzezinski, and they created Al-Qaeda. They created the Islamic Brigades. And Brzezinski doesn't actually deny it. I have an interview here. He says, uh, he, he says yes, it was an excellent idea to, to do that. You know, we, we, uh, we funded the brigades. We brought in the, the, the Wahhabi uh, sects from Saudi Arabia, which set up the training camps, and, and then it was financed by drug money and so on and so forth. All this is documented. Actually, nobody even within the CIA will actually deny it. But the official story is... He went against us. We supported Osama. We supported Al-Qaeda. It was for a worthy cause. It was during the Cold War. And in the post-war era, Al-Qaeda has turned on its sponsors. In intelligence jargon, that, uh, that is called the blowback. It's when an intelligence asset goes against the, the sponsors, uh, which in this case is the American intelligence apparatus. So that essentially the CIA is the ill-fated victim of this, with Osama going against us, okay? And that is, the, that is the, in a sense, it's a missing link because it, the blowback says, yes, it is an outside enemy. We helped them initially. He went against us. They can't deny the, the historical record. But I can tell you that this is simply a big lie. And it's not so much, I mean, the lie, there's, the lie has got, got to be so big. Um, it's not the question of whether there was foreknowledge, okay, of the 9-11 attacks. Um, it has to do with the fact that Al-Qaeda is a creature of the CIA and has remained a creature of the CIA right up, right up until the present. And that is simply not, it's not a question again of saying yes, maybe, okay? 
It, it is something which is so well documented from, the, from official sources. Now, I'm going to read you a quote, and I would like you to guess the source of this quote. Okay? It refers to the early to, to mid-90s in Bosnia-Herzegovina, where, as you know, uh, Al-Qaeda was active in supporting the Bosnian Muslim army, uh, bringing in uh, mujahideen and uh, weapons uh, financed by, this, by uh, various uh, sources, but essentially this was part of Al-Qaeda. And the, the, the report says the following, the Clinton administration's hand-on involvement with Islamic Network's arms pipeline included inspection of missiles by U.S. government officials, the Third World Relief Agency, a Sudan-based phony humanitarian organization, was a major link in the arms pipeline to Bosnia. TWRA is believed to be connected with Osama bin Laden. So there you have the Clinton administration collaborating with an organization which has links to Al-Qaeda. This document was, is a public document, but it was not. They decided to keep, keep it... Uh, you know, more or less private to themselves because they wanted to discredit Clinton uh, for his affair with Monica Lewinsky, okay? And uh, I know that there was discussion within the Republican Party to trigger uh, an Osama gate, a Bosnia gate, uh, Osama scandal, which would then backlash and a uh, on the Clinton administration and accuse Clinton of collaborating with Islamic terrorists. Okay? A bit like the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, and it was decided within the Republican Party not to pursue that particular cause because that was their cause. That was, their, that was the continuity of foreign policy right from the beginning. Okay? And it could backlash and it would destroy the continuity. So they preferred to go for the easy Monica Lewinsky scandal which would uh, which would uh, uh, denigrate uh, and discredit the administration for something which is uh, admittedly not as serious as, as collaborating with, with the terrorists. Okay? But I mean, we have, I, we have numerous uh, evidence, we have many points of evidence of collaboration between uh, agencies of the U.S. government, the military and intelligence in particular, on the one hand, and, uh, and the Al-Qaeda network. Uh, and uh, uh, these do not date back to a bygone era. Now, what's the source of this document? It's the Republican Party. In other words, the Republican Party, it's a 97 do, 1997 document. In 1997, the, the Republican Party was, was accusing the Clinton administration of collaborating with Al-Qaeda. They go back to 2001 or 2000, at least the last firmly documented um, joint military operation between Al-Qaeda and the, and the Pentagon uh, dates to August 2001, barely a month before the 9-11 attacks, uh, where in, in the context of the civil war in Macedonia, where you had within the same paramilitary formation, terrorist paramilitary formation, so-called National Liberation Army, you had Mujahideen sent in by Al-Qaeda with senior military officers detached by the Pentagon uh, and uh, who were there under a contract with military professional resources, a private mercenary company, but they were U.S. military, okay? And they were, they were working together. We have the photo, photographs and we have statements by the Macedonian Prime Minister which actually accuses the United States of supporting, uh, of, of supporting terrorism. And, and there's absolutely no doubt that these things took place. And we have congressional records and so on, Okay? Uh, and in that process, and that's very important, uh, it's outlined in the diagram, there is a, 
a long-standing historical relationship between Al-Qaeda and the Pakistan's, uh, Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence, the ISI. Now, the ISI uh, was essentially the go-between uh, in, the, in the operation launched uh, in the early 80s, first under Carter, then under Reagan. Several secret directors were issued, national security decision directors were issued by, under Reagan to provide support to the, to the Islamic brigades, and it was done through Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, acting as a go-between. So that, in a sense, Pakistan's inter-services intelligence has always acted, in a sense, as a subsidiary of the CIA. And uh, that relationship, incidentally, was never severed. The relationship between Pakistan's ISI and the CIA has never been severed. And on the other hand, Pakistan's ISI continues to this, to this date to support Islamic terrorist organizations in different parts of the Middle East and, and uh, Southeast Asia, uh, even in the, in the western province of China, and they are doing this on behalf of, the, of, it, of their counterparts in the CIA. Okay? The ISI is, is leading these, these covert operations, terrorist organizations, uh, in favor of terrorist organizations, and they're doing it uh, while maintaining very close bilateral ties uh, with their U.S. counterparts uh, in, uh, in Langley, namely the CIA. That background has to be understood. Now, we have reason to believe that Pakistan's ISI is part of the 9-11 conspiracy. And this is not, and at the same time, Pakistan's ISI has links to the CIA and to the Pentagon. In late September 2001, there was an FBI report to the effect that Pakistan, that unnamed sources in Pakistan were financing the terrorists, Al-Qaeda. Uh, the relationship is documented by other sources, including the Council of Foreign Relations. But then, those, that statement by the FBI was then later confirmed that uh, the money transfers which were sent out of Pakistan by the ISI had been ordered by the head of the agency, General Mahmoud Ahmad. In other words, the FBI confirms that there was an undercover role whereby Pakistan's inter-services intelligence transferred money to the ringleader of the 9-11 attacks, Mohamed Atta. This came out in the press reports, and, it, and it, the, the report itself was commented on network television. And they speak in the FBI report of the money man, the mastermind, the financiers behind the terrorists. And in a subsequent report, the name of the, the head of Pakistan's inter-services intelligence is actually mentioned as him having given the order to transfer this money to, to the alleged terrorist of 9-11. The alleged money man was on an official visit to Washington at the time when, when these attacks occurred. So here you are. Uh, this is... Uh, so please understand a little bit the linkages. The FBI states has a report which suggests that Pakistan's ISI and the head of Pakistan's ISI is the institutional architect and financier behind the terrorists. Okay? 
Yet the same individual which is identified in, the, in, in, in these reports, and there were several other reports, one of Indian intelligence, is on an official visit to Washington. In other words, the money man behind the terrorist, General Mahmoud Ahmad, which is head of Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, an organization which has continued to support terrorist organizations for the last 20 or 30 years, since the, well, since the early 80s, is on an official visit to Washington from the 4th to the 13th of September. On the 9th of September, the leader of the Northern Alliance, General Shah Massoud, is assassinated. In a, it's a kamikaze assassination two days before 9-11. Uh, uh, and the official statement of the Northern Alliance, which was transmitted to the U.S. government, accuses the ISI of having, of having uh, um, instigated this assassination. It's interesting that all this, of course, is an, very carefully acknowledged by the, by the U.S. media. In fact, the Washington Post states very clearly uh, in... Uh, in an editorial which came several months later, um, they, they point to the fact that this general who was met at the very senior levels of the, of the Bush administration, meeting two individuals in charge of, who are now in charge of the inquiry, Senator Bob Graham and Representative Porter Goss. Okay? And it just so happens that on the morning of 9-11, uh, the two individuals who are now entrusted with that investigation, and who, which have, who have produced this, this 800 or 900 page report with 28 missing pages, well, these individuals were having breakfast with the money man on the morning of 9-11. The, the US media gives us the evidence that the ISI is behind it, the Council on Foreign Relations has documented it, but they don't connect the dots to the extent that they say, how come this money man is received red carpet treatment in Washington and meets virtually everybody in, in, the, you know, in the Congress and the Bush administration and so on and so forth. And then, on the morning of the 12th, well, actually on two successive meetings, the 12th and the 13th, he meets Colin Powell and Richard Armitage, and he's invited into the State Department on the 13th to discuss the terms of Pakistan's cooperation in the war on terrorism. Okay? So bear in mind, you have this, this money man behind 9-11 is invited into, into Colin Powell's office, and there they discuss how the money man can help in going after terrorists. It's a bit like asking Al Capone to help in going after organized crime. It's the same, I mean, it's the same procedure, but it, it, it in other words, Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, which is the institution behind these terrorist organizations, is also the organization which ultimately is going to serve the interests of the U.S. government in going after the terrorists. And the Conclusion one draws, apart from all the other evidence which has accumulated, the stand-down orders, the, the mystery surrounding the collapse of the World Trade Towers, the, the, the collapse of WTC-7, for instance, which is shrouded in, in, in mystery, the cover-ups, um, and so on and so forth, um, all of this suggests that... First of all, that the foreknowledge issue is an absolute, is a red herring, okay? It's there to mislead people, because it, it, what it does is it says, oh yes, well, there were failures, intelligence lapses, etc. Uh, the FBI didn't do its job, or the CIA, it was, we didn't know, but we didn't know when they were going to hit us, etc. Of course, they knew, okay? Intelligence assets, uh, which collaborate with, uh, with the U.S. intelligence uh, apparatus, are known to their sponsors. Uh, this is not an outside enemy, it is, it is an inside enemy. Even if these groups have a certain degree of autonomy, they are instruments of U.S. foreign policy, the instruments of the U.S. military intelligence apparatus. On the 10th of September, 
Osama bin Laden was admitted to the military hospital in Rawalpindi, Pakistan. Now anybody who's been to Rawalpindi knows that it's swarming with U.S. military advisors. Okay? The whole place is it's the, it's the base of the, of the Pakistani military and, and so on. And nobody of that stature, Osama bin Laden, um, would be able to enter into the hospital without some connections at the very senior levels of the military intelligence apparatus. Uh, and of course, you can always claim the reward. Okay? Now, that piece of news is, of course, very, very important because it, it refutes all the statements made by Donald Rumsfeld who says, well, we don't know where he is. It's like looking for a needle in a stack of hay. You've heard that several times, right? Says, well, we don't know. Maybe he's in Afghanistan. We don't know where he is. Well, this is, this report confirms, and I, and I think it's a reliable report because it's my favorite anchorman, Dan Rather. <laughs> CBS News reporting from Rawalpindi, Pakistan. Now you see, Dan Rather again does not draw the implications of, of his reports. He goes to the hospital, interviews the people, sends back the images and so on. We have the transcripts of this report. And he says, here, Dan Rather, reporting from Rawalpindi, Osama spent, uh, was hospitalized on the 10th, and that was only 24 hours before the 9-11 attacks. And then, they, but he doesn't, he doesn't connect the dots and say, well, Donald Rumsfeld is a big liar, okay? Because if Dan Rather says that he was there, either Dan Rather is a liar or Donald Rumsfeld is a liar. Somebody is lying, okay? But... If, if he were, if Osama was there one day before these attacks, we could have gone in and arrested him at, in his hospital bed in Rawalpindi, and this would have saved a lot of time and energy and so on and so forth. But obviously that was not part of the agenda which the U.S. military intelligence establishment want to achieve. So what these what these incidents suggest is in effect that the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden, this mythical figure, are known to the intelligence community, have always been known. He could have been arrested on numerous occasions. The history suggests that Al-Qaeda is an organization which was created by the CIA and that those links have have been sustained ever since. And it makes a tremendous difference in the way we understand these events. We, we have to understand that, this, that the war on terrorism is fabricated. It is a complete fabrication. But at the same time, it is the doctrine uh, which justifies all these actions, both internally and internationally. The police state inside... The, the militarization uh, of the Middle East and Central Asia. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's part of the national security doctrine. It is a big lie. And uh, it's perhaps the biggest lie in U.S. history. And it is absolutely essential that a consistent anti-war movement reveal the lie. We can't simply go around saying, and that's why I say these the war and 9-11 have, 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 a, have a relationship because 9-11 is the, the basis which justifies the war on terrorism and this war of conquest. And uh, you, you might find people, even among progressive organizations in Canada, who say, well, you know, I, I think I'm against the war in Iraq, but I think we should go after this guy, Osama bin Laden, okay? Uh, we, we, have to, uh, we have to weed out the terrorists. I think that's a, I support Bush on, on, the, on the terrorist thing, but I don't think we should invade Iraq, etc., etc. And bear in mind that throughout the propaganda campaign was to try to establish links between, between terrorists and, the, and their sponsors, namely the Iraqi authorities. 
and, and so that you had a very consistent propaganda campaign which was, which was there day after day telling us that, that America is under threat and so on and so forth. And in the last uh, speech of Bush uh, um, in, the, in the General Assembly and his previous speech that he made a, a few weeks ago, he is now using a new term which is called the civilized world. Okay, we are the civilized world. Uh, so this, I think, uh, uh, is, uh, is essential that we build this understanding that it be part of a consistent anti-war movement. An anti-war movement cannot be based on solely on anti-war rallies. We have to consistently create an, uh, an organizational structure, a network of uh, which spreads across the land uh, uh, of, of grassroots, uh, sense, uh, sen uh, educate our, our fellow citizens, uh, spread the word, establish committees at the local level, perhaps a far less uh, dramatic way of building an anti-war movement. And uh, Because what happens with these big rallies, they, they, they take place and then subsequently people go home, feel good that they've done something, but we need the organizational structures. We have to question the legitimacy not of the main political and military actors behind this war pro project. States has a superior military power in relation to any other rival with very sophisticated weaponry, some of which are not really even known to the public. Um, we're talking about uh, secret weapons programs, uh, climatic uh, environmental warfare, the HARP program, new generation of nuclear weapons. Uh, Star Wars, in fact, I should say that Iraq was the first Star Wars because 60% of the missiles were, were sent using the, the GPS, the Global Positioning System, by satellite. Okay? They were launched from, from, uh, from aircraft, uh, uh, from, uh, they were, were launched from... Uh, from uh, various uh, locations, but they were tele teleguided by, uh, by the, uh, the satellites. So we're dealing with a tremendous advance of the United States in relation to any one of the other powers in the world today. So I think that that's the first uh, uh, issue. The second is that the Anglo-American oil companies, in the wake of this war, where the Whatever we, whether we like it or not, they have established their control uh, over 11% of the world's oil reserves. And they also, more or less, they have control over 36% because that includes Saudi Arabia. And then if you add the Emirates to that, it's, it's even more. But the, the, the issue is the following. Now, that oil is administered by the CPA, the, the Coalition Provisional Authority, okay? It is not being privatized, and I think it's not being privatized for very precise reasons because the U.S. military wants to maintain control over those oil resources. And they, they can then hand it out to whoever they want, but uh, they, uh, they are still maintaining the, the, the control over Iraqis' oil wealth, and uh, they have an upper edge 
in relation to the other competing global powers in the world today. Could you comment on what you think uh, Saddam Hussein's role in all of this? Well, first of all, Saddam Hussein was initially uh, installed by the United States. Going back to the early periods, he was, he was very much uh, supported by the U.S., the weapons of mass, so-called weapons of mass destruction were delivered by U.S. and German corporations. We've documented that in our magazine. He received U.S. military aid in the context of the Iran-Iraq war, which preceded the, the first Gulf War. The links between uh, Saddam Hussein and 9-11, there, is, there are no links. I mean, uh, the, the media, the U.S. media have attempted to create the illusion that Osama bin Laden is working with Saddam and Saddam is protecting bin Laden, etc., etc. There's absolutely no foundation to those, uh, to those statements. The, on the contrary, there, there's a lot of evidence, as I've suggested here, that the links are between Osama and the Bush administration. Okay? If, if, if there are links, documented links, we have links between Colin Powell and Al-Qaeda. Very precise links. Okay? Uh, I can get into that. We have links between the Bush family and the Bin Laden family. They're financial business ties. We have links between uh, um, Thomas Keane, the head of the 9-11 Commission, and Osama Bin Laden because Thomas Keane, who is a uh, former governor of New Jersey and who heads the 9-11 Commission, who is responsible for shedding light on, on Al-Qaeda, happens to be a, a former business partner of the brother-in-law of Osama bin Laden. Okay? And I can go on and on and on okay, of, of these, the links between members of the Bush administration and the bin Ladens and, and so on and so forth, both at in the, the realm of financial relations, but also in the, in the arena of, of, in, of, uh, of these covert uh, CIA operations. Uh, so uh, the, the links between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda have been fabricated, and ironically they're fabricated by the same people who actually use Al-Qaeda as an intelligence asset. messaging um, service is, is, uh, is correct. That there, was, uh, there were email messages which confirmed that the, that the attacks would take place several hours before the attacks took place. And that's on record. But there are many other uh, indications. There's, there's the inside trading on, on, on uh, airline stocks which took place on the 8th, 9th, 10th of September. Uh, and which, where financial institutions made billions of dollars in, in, in uh, short selling, what we call short selling the, the stock of, of airline companies, or so betting on collapse. Uh, uh, this is in, in, for people who trade in options, they know exactly it's a put option on, on, a, on a stock. Uh, now, with regard to war, to these killing people as a means to justify uh, particular foreign policy initiatives, this is nothing new. There's a, the, the, the most uh, the well-documented case of this is a secret blueprint of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which is called Operation Northwoods. Now, Operation Northwoods was a secret plan to blow up an airplane and to kill people in the Cuban community in Miami, in Miami and then blame it on Fidel Castro as a pretext to invade Cuba. Okay? It sounds 
you know, you could make a movie out of it, but uh, it, it is actually that those documents have been declassified, they're available on our website, and, it, and uh, actually we published an article in, in the magazine, in the first issue of the magazine, Operation Northwoods was precisely that. It was to, it, it was to create civilian casualties, and as, and I quote from the document, a useful wave of indignation would follow. Obviously, France, Germany, Belgium are not stupid. They, they know what's going on. Why does the EU insist on expanding eastward, like especially when Poland is over and over again referred to as America's Trojan horse in the EU? Do they see anything there? Do they think they can overcome America's influence over the Eastern European states? Or are they just... Well, you see, there's, there are two processes taking place simultaneously. One is called European enlargement, which is the integration of new members into the European community and new associate members, okay, in which the, the, the countries of the former Soviet bloc of Eastern Europe are, are candidates for, for full membership in the European Union. And there's another process which is called NATO enlargement. And NATO enlargement... Is to, is to bring these countries into the orbit uh, of, the, of, uh, of NATO, but mainly of the United States, in, in the form of military agreements and so on. And these two processes are, in a sense, competing with one another. Uh, it, it, I, I, don't, I still think that Poland is really, uh, is really uh, it's in the back door of, 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 of Germany. It's not, it's not part, it won't... It's not possible for the United States necessarily to establish itself in Poland uh, or let's say the Czech Republic or, or, Slo or, or the Slovak Republic for that matter. The Balkans is, is, a, is a different matter. Croatia is in the German, German orbit, uh, Montenegro, Serbia possibly in the orbit of Germany, Macedonia, Bulgaria, Albania are in the US orbit. And that has a lot to do with pipelines. So there's a, there's a struggle for territorial control. The euro is the currency in all those... The, the euro is being used as a proxy currency in, in, in the Balkans, in Eastern Europe. Um, it's not being used... Uh, the, the dollar is being used in some of the former Soviet republics of the Caucasian region, Azerbaijan, Georgia... Uh, the Tajik Republic, and so on, where there's, if you look at the map that I put up initially, you'll see how, how, how the U.S. military has expanded into that region. And I was wondering if you uh, would make, say, a comparison uh, between what happened um, in that week and the Nazis setting fire to the, uh, the German parliament. It's much more sophisticated. There's that, that analogy has been made by many authors. Uh, and in fact, there, there have been other analogies. We've also drawn the analogy between 9-11 and Pearl Harbor. Okay? We, we know it's documented that the United States knew that Pearl Harbor would be attacked. Okay? And they let it happen. It's, it's somewhat different because it was still the Japanese Air Force that did the bombing. Okay? But they knew it, and we have intelligence documents to prove it. In the case of 9-11, we have so much information which... The, the information doesn't necessarily tell us who did it but the information refutes the official narrative in, 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 in many ways. And it, it shows that there was cover-up and complicity of key members of the Bush administration. I'll give you another example. I, I mentioned the role of the General Mahmoud Ahmad. Okay? Now, if these guys didn't have anything to hide, how is it that when Condoleezza Rice had her press conference, which was held just in the wake of... You remember the, the, the May 16th press knew when the foreknowledge issue hit the tabloids. That was about a year, a year and a half ago, uh, in May of 2002. 
She gave a press conference, and then there was an Indian journalist who asked the question. He said, is it true that there was a that the head of Pakistan's inter-services intelligence was in Washington at the time of the tax and had meetings with you and other people, etc., etc. Important piece of information. How come that sentence was withdrawn from the transcripts? Uh, I went through the audio transcripts and the video transcripts, and then I went through the, 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 the written transcripts, and when they said... Is it true that, and then blank, inaudible, was in Washington? <laughs> it says, Dr. Rice, are you aware of the reports at the time that inaudible was in Washington on September 11, and $100,000 was wired to Pakistan to this group here in this area? Okay? The money man behind 9-11. So that was inaudible. And then there was another trans... So the... the I looked at the CNN transcript and then I looked at the White House transcript and they're both inaudible. I, then I went to the original tapes and I listened to them and they're clear cut and I fe checked with a third transcript, the federal document system, they give the correct transcription. So do, what do they have to hide? Why, what, why are they hiding this information? Why can you find these documents? Uh, if, if I was behind a mastermind like this and Wanting, uh, preparing for such a long time since the, uh, the Soviet-Afghani uh, war to get to a solution at the end. I wouldn't want you to find this information. Certainly the internet has provided us with information which we couldn't, we could never have dreamt of knowing about five years ago. We'd have to go and spend a lifetime in libraries and doing interviews and you know, and, and so on. It, it would be impossible to get all this information and to patch it together. And, and, uh, and I, I mean, but then the, I think the reason is that most people who go on the internet don't do this kind of work. They go and, you know, they, it's for entertainment or whatever, okay? And uh, uh, they don't scan 2,000 newspapers, okay? I can tell you, I scan, I scan 2,000 newspapers uh, to get this kind of information. I, and I use Lexis, which is a very sophisticated search engine, which, which most probably your university library has. And I, I suggest you use that, because the Internet itself won't give you everything. But you can find this information. It's there. Uh, the, the thing is that the official, the official statements and the media tell you everything you need to know as long as you can cross it with other information and you can scan through it. Uh, the, the problem with the media is that they provide information and then they refute the information that they provide. Okay? In the same way as Dan Rather says, oh, I'm here in, the, in, in Rawalpindi and Osama was here on the 10th. He was hospitalized for a kidney condition. But Dan Rather doesn't say, oh, Don, Don Rumsfeld, you're a liar. Oh, he, he could have said it politely. It seems that this information refutes the statements of the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, who says that you, we can't find him. It's like looking for a needle in a stack of hay. But he would lose his job if he said that. Well, People in the U.S. Congress, on both sides of the House, know the information that, that, that I presented to you here. Some of them don't dismiss it or they, they haven't analyzed it, but certainly the people who sit on the committees, they know. They know, the people who sit on the Intelligence Committee, the Armed Services Committee, they know about this. The thing is that we're not strictly dealing uh, we're dealing with the criminalization of the state, where the, the people who, who are part of the state system, the legislature, the presidency, the various agencies, 
are complicit in this consensus. They, and they also uh, are complicit, also supportive of, of the seat of power within, within that, uh, you know, that system. So that they support their president in the same way as we support the Canadian government. Uh, however, I think that this situation is possible because the information does not trickle down to the broader public in a way which would significantly change their, their point of view. I mean, people in, in the United States are, are, are maybe are, un, are very uneducated. 60% of the, of the population in, in America believe that Saddam Hussein was responsible for 9-11, okay? Even though uh, the press said otherwise, okay? So the propaganda apparatus is so strong that it drowns this kind of information. But I tell you who, who is responsible and who is complicit. It's the media. And it, it's, it's the CBC as well. It's the, you know, it's Radio-Canada. Uh, I, know, I know that from my own personal experience because I've been approached by journalists and journalists are very often are very honest people and they say, oh yes, I'd like to do an interview and then, at, and then two hours before they call up and say it's been cancelled. Uh, George Bush uh, has, has insinuated because they said that they found some evidence of weapons, uh, of nuclear weapons being developed by Iran, etc., which is also a big fabrication, uh, that they're going to invade uh, Iran. They have plans, they have plans already ongoing to invade Iran, okay? Now, whether they will actually do it or not, that's another matter. Uh, and they're not in a very good situation right now to start on, to open another, another war theater, okay? They also have plans to, to invade North Korea, okay? Now, maybe that, those plans are, are on, on standby. I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest that this war is, is, is inevitable. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here, okay? The war is, is, an, is, is something we can reverse the tide. But, and the only way to reverse the tide is, is, to, is to question the legitimacy of the, of the system which, of the project which is behind these war, these war uh, preparations. And that's not simply Bush, okay? It's not Bush. Bush is a figurehead. It's much more, it's much more fundamental. It has to do with the, the whole economic, political structures of this system. It has to do with capitalism as, as we know it. And I'm not saying that in an ideological sense, but you know, who is behind the Bush administration, the big defense contractors building nuclear weapons, uh, the, the big banks, Wall Street, uh, Citigroup, uh, you know, uh, the big ph pharmaceutical companies uh, or the big uh, agribusiness companies which are also involved in, in destroying agriculture all over the world through genetically modified seeds uh, and so on. It, it's, it's much broader than that, but again, uh, and when you start looking at the state system, it's not simply the criminalization. I mean, it's not simply a, a set of individuals, the neocons. It's a much broader complicity, which includes the Democrats, okay? It certainly includes the Democrats, and they're, com they're, on, you know, they're on these committees together. They share the, they, their buddy-buddy with the Republicans. Uh, and uh, uh, the 9-11 Commission is a joint uh, parliamentary, a joint... Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the joint inquiry. It's Porter Goss and Bob Graham. Bob Graham is a, is a Democrat. The other guy is a, is a Republican. And, and they're, they're involved in a cover-up operation. So uh, it's the legitimacy of the entire system which is at stake. And uh, we, can't, we, we cannot simply reverse the tide uh, by unseating one or other of these rulers. It, but it's the first step, no doubt. To undermine a propaganda campaign, you have to have, you have, to have a, a, a strategy of, of uh, sense, you have to sensitize, inform, educate the broader public 
on these issues. In other words, and that is not simply done, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something which has to be done at the grassroots. It has to be, it has to be done through networking. It, it's the kind of work which is similar to what, what we do when we have an election campaign. We go door to door. We set up committees in our, in our, in our workplaces, in our churches, uh, at the parish level, in neighborhoods. In, in, uh, you know, at, if we belong to, uh, to a trade union, we do it in the trade union. If we, uh, if we belong to, uh, to an NGO, we try to raise it uh, and, 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 and discuss it at that level. There are many municipalities in America which are bringing these issues to the municipal council, for instance. So what I'm saying is that those initiatives have to emerge, and they have to emerge in a co cohesive way. Uh, we have to also beware of organizations which appear to be progressive and anti-war, but which ultimately demobilize a meaningful anti-war agenda. Okay? I mean, you saw Michael Moore's statement. I mean, with all due respect, I, 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 thought he, I think he's a great guy. But when he says that, that Wesley Clark is his, uh, you know, is his hero, I, I mean, there's something really wrong there, okay? Because he said, oh yeah, Bush, you, you're a liar, okay? Your t time is over. If you remember his speech at the Academy Awards. But now he's backing Wesley Clark, okay? And lots of people in America who believe in the anti-war movement, they think that the Democrats is an alternative. It's not. So it's the entire system which has to be thrown out. And how do you do that? You don't do it by, through mass rallies, you do it through, through building up a movement at the grassroots level which then spreads across the land and which becomes, and, and you deconstruct this propaganda campaign. You show that the leaders are liars. Because the lie is that the, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Okay? The truth is what is going to destroy these people. Because they're telling us, I mean, they are telling us that nuclear weapons is a means to go after Osama bin Laden. Okay? They, they are trying to justify nuclear weapons as an instrument of defense. Can you imagine? Now, very few media have actually analyzed this new doctrine. When I, when I see what you say happening in a, a civilized society, I feel afraid for us who belong to the non-civilized society. <laughs> I, I, I can see 400 years ago, the civilized society coming in my continent taking people in, into slavery. Now I'm, I'm thinking that the civilized society again will come if we just continue to discover petrol, diamond on my continent. I feel really very scared because not just the leaders who are talking lies. I can see the population continuing to elect those same leaders and I'm saying who is the civilized society? Is it the whole community or is it Bush and his five, ten people around him? Civilized world. This term is used as a propaganda instrument. It's there to justify but it's the civilized world. Uh, in fact, the British, uh, the British Empire used this same term when they went, and the French as well, okay, when they went into Central Africa. It is very disturbing that these, uh, that these terms are used, particularly uh, when we bear uh, to the important heritage of the regions of Asia and Africa, which have civilizations which predate anything in North America, going back... 6,000 years. 
It's, I, I spoke about the Anglo-American axis, but Israel is part of that military axis, even though they're not part of the military coalition. They don't have troops uh, in, inside Iraq, uh, at least not, not, not officially. Uh, they, uh, but, but again, uh, the, the various features of Israeli policy which are tied into the Iraqi question, the, the project of a, of, a, of a grand Israel, the extension of of uh, Israel uh, colonization into Mesopotamia, the establishment of pipeline routes, of water, of water pipelines, which would then uh, uh, be, uh, would, would, uh, in other words, the, the, the water resources of Mesopotamia, the, 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 uh, the Euphrates, would be used uh, by Israel and so on. All these, all these things have been, have, have been articulated uh, to the extent that we, we can't really look at we can't look at the Iraqi situation without an understanding of what's going on in, in Palestine. There are several war theaters within the Middle East, and, and the, the, palace, the war in Palestine is part of that broader uh, process. With regard to war pretext incidents, the Israel, uh, the um, Sharon's um, uh, defense advisor, uh, General Dagan uh, put together a plan, it's called the Dagan Plan, which was actually formulated prior to Sharon's election, which is precisely to create civilian deaths and to use these civilian deaths, civilian deaths on both sides, but civilian deaths on the, on the Israeli side, which would then create the useful wave of indignation which would be used uh, for uh, further uh, militarization, occupation, of, of the occupation and colonization of the, of the Palestinian uh, territories. This, uh, this um, Dagan plan was, then became what was called Operation Justified Vengeance. That's its... Uh, translation from the Hebrew. It was, it was a plan of the Israeli Defense Force uh, devised by, by Dagan, and it, it, it has a scenario, uh, it's an intelligence operation, has a scenario of civilian deaths. They actually, pro, they actually planned how many people would die over a particular period, and what this would do in terms of justifying particular actions against the Palestinian people and, of course, ultimately against the Palestinian Authority. And we see where this has led us, uh, where uh, Israel now uh, states that, uh, as an official policy, that they want to assassinate Arafat. And uh, the United States uh, has uh, put its veto to a resolution in the Security Council, which condemns Israel in its planned assassination of Arafat. So, in, in effect, the United States it has supported this policy. If you uh, identify that the United States military occupation, let's say, of Iraq or Afghanistan is the source of people's suffering, not to mention all the economic policies which are imposed on, on 160 countries around the world under the IMF auspices, that, that one should ultimately oppose this type of system which is, neo, which is war and globalization. Okay? It's neoliberalism and it's, it's militarization, it's criminalization of the state, it's, it's the derogation of fundamental human rights. And then you build your society. You, you, don't build, you don't resist against this system by proposing some abstract paradigm. Okay? You build it by, through, through a movement which ultimately deconstructs and rebuilds
counter discourse is a very important instrument in in supporting regimes, in supporting governments, in supporting war agendas, because it's a way in which you manufacture dissent, uh, which uh, which uh, ultimately uh, provides legitimacy to the established order. Uh, the the manufacturing of dissent means that people express their dissent and their resentment, uh, whether it's against the war or whether it's against globalization, in a particular stylized way. And the boundaries of dissent are already established. So in other words, again, they will say, I'm against the war, but I, I, I think Saddam Hussein was a, was a bad guy. And that's a form of dissent which ultimately reinforces the system rather than weakens it. And in other words, there's a big strand of, of, of opposition within America which ultimately, uh, by making this kind of, of, uh, of statement and, uh, and analyzing in a particular way these occurrences, are in fact supporting uh, the, the New World Order agenda. Not necessarily Bush, but they're saying, okay, well, we don't like Bush, but then the Democrats will come in. And in other words, they want the system to remain afloat, and they don't realize that, that, uh, that ultimately uh, uh, there's nothing which is, uh, which is going to... Uh, it, it, there's nothing in their positions and in their activism which is going to reverse the tide of, of the military-industrial complex of the new drive towards uh, nuclear weapons. This system is increasingly characterized by very centralized corporate control. Eventually the agenda, and that's the corporate agenda, is to privatize all forms of state-supported uh, social activities. A massive redirection of resources from civilian activities into, into the production of weapons and all the concurrent activities which support the war agenda. There are lower levels of demand within the system because there are lower levels of employment and, and the, the, the important thing there is that this military industrial complex doesn't create jobs. It's, it's uh, not comparable in any way to the 1930s or 40s, where the war economy was the basis uh, for getting out of the Great Depression. Okay? This war economy does not create jobs other than the, the, the young people who are recruited to go and fight in the Middle East. Uh, but it does not, uh, it's, it's highly uh, capital intensive, it, it's, it's not a big assembly line. Uh, uh, where, you know, thousands uh, or tens of thousands of people are being hired and, and where jobs are created. Uh, and uh, so that we're, we're not, we cannot expect uh, that the war economy will, uh, will generate uh, uh, new jobs which will then uh, allow other sectors of the economy to progress. It's, it's quite the opposite prisons are being used to assemble goods, to produce commodities. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, it's in a sense, it's an appendage of the, of the cheap labor economy. But you see, there's another aspect when you, when you get into the international uh, dimensions of this economic crisis, is that what is sustaining the U.S. Uh, consumer goods industries today is the fact that a large percentage of what we actually consume on a day-to-day -day basis is produced in China, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Mexico, Indonesia. In other words, in countries where the wages are 30, 40, 50 times lower than in the United States. The people who are pulling the strings in the background the big corporations, the big Wall Street banks, the, the military-industrial complex, they uh, want to ensure the continuity of the system. 
And the way to do that is to pull the plug on a president who is discredited in the eyes of public opinion and then ensure the transition to a new, uh, you know, a new group of people, a new set of, of political puppets who will then uh, perform um, perhaps with a slightly different agenda but ultimately uh, supported by the same uh, economic uh, uh, corporate interests that operate behind the scenes. I think that's really what is important to understand is that the Bush administration and even members of Bush entourage, senior Bush officials, are instruments. They're not, ult they're not ultimately the architects of this war agenda. During the Clinton administration, all these war plans were already, um, were already on the agenda. The national security doctrine of the Clinton administration uh, clearly points out that Iraq uh, is a priority. There are even documents of central command which say Iraq first and then Iran, and, then, and that the objective is to secure uh, control over, over oil uh, in that region. It's not an issue of, of a narrow group of advisors, the so-called neocons, um, in the Pentagon and the, and, the, and the State Department. It's a much broader process where particular groups of officials um, may come to rotate from one administration to the next so as to ensure the U.S. Uh, agenda of sequential theater wars, which is outlined in the PNAC. There's ample evidence to suggest that um, the Bush administration, senior officials within the Bush administration were involved in acts of complicity and camouflage with regard to the events of 9-11. And this is not simply a question of foreknowledge. It's, it's the fact that the CIA has supported Al-Qaeda, that Al-Qaeda is an intelligence asset, that Al-Qaeda has performed on behalf of United States uh, covert operations in different parts of the world. It's not a blowback to the era of the Cold War. Once you recognize that uh, Al-Qaeda is a creature of U.S. foreign policy and of the U.S. Uh, intelligence apparatus, your understanding and perceptions on 9-11 are, are totally different to what they might be in the case where you're, you know, uh, uh, an anti-war activist who wants to change uh, the course of foreign policy, etc., etc. Because the lie, ultimately, behind this, uh, this camouflage and complicity is so grotesque. I, I'm not suggesting necessarily that the Bush administration ordered the destruction of the, of the, of the World Trade Center, but uh, if the Bush administration is saying that Al-Qaeda is behind it, and that Al-Qaeda is a threat to America, while at the same time we have evidence that uh, Al-Qaeda uh, is collaborating with, um, uh, with U.S. government agencies in covert operations in the Balkans, and that this happened you know, barely a few months before 9-11, that we have evidence that, um, that Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, its military intelligence, supports the terrorists and to support these terrorist organizations and that's corroborated by by the Council on Foreign Relations. If that is true on the one hand and if on the other hand that this same organization, Pakistan's ISI, has closed bilateral relations with the CIA, with the State Department, I mean I, I'm talking at the very, very senior levels, then there's something uh, fundamentally fishy uh, on these links. Uh, go beneath the surface you then realize that, in fact, uh, Osama bin Laden is a creature of the U.S. Um, intelligence apparatus. His whereabouts are known. Um, Al-Qaeda has collaborated with, with the U.S. military and intelligence uh, and continues to collaborate. Um, when you start looking into, let's say, the Bali bombing, and then you realize that the Bali bombing is conducted 
by a group which uh, was trained in CIA camps in Afghanistan, that it has close links to Indonesian intelligence, and that Indonesian intelligence has close links to the CIA, well then you say, well there's something fishy there as well. These are things which people have to take cognizance of, because they are the tools of an anti-war movement. An anti-war movement is not simply uh, one of expressing anti-war sentiment, of saying, I'm against the war. An anti-war movement is to disarm the, the, the main political and military actors behind the war agenda. It's to deconstruct them. It's to remove their legitimacy in the eyes of public opinion. A large seg segment of the anti-war movement actually supports the assumptions of the Bush administration regarding 9-11 to the fact that Al-Qaeda is a threat to, to the security of America and that the war on terrorism is, is, a, is a valid objective of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, of course, that weakens the anti-war movement because you have a large segment of people who say, yes, I'm against the war, but I, I do support our administration in the war on terrorism, as if the two things were, were, were disconnected. And the, the, the issue is that the war on terrorism is the justification for conducting the war. Uh, namely, 9-11 and the hoax behind 9-11 and the government camouflage and conspiracy behind 9-11 becomes the instrument for waging a war on the so-called sponsors of terrorism, the state sponsors of terrorism, uh, which are the countries such as North Korea, Iraq, Iran, and so on. There is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that he is amassing them to use against our friends, against our allies, and against us. And then you have this propaganda campaign which, which attempts to link um, a, re a relationship between, let's say, Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. It's a failure to understand what is behind 9-11 as, a, in fact, a conspiracy on the part of the U.S., of the US government. In the 1980s, in the context of the Iran-Contra scandal, where Oliver North, of course, was indicted, along with Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger, um, they, were the, they were the visible uh, personalities in the scandal, but the individual, the person within uh, the US military who actually um, played a very key role was Colin Powell because Colin Powell signed the release forms for the transfer of weapons from logistics to Iran and with the proceeds of those weapons sales uh, they funded the Mujahideen the Islamic Brigades as well as the Nicaraguan Contra and we also know that Richard Armitage was behind that as well. So these individuals have, over the years, played a role in the process of support, of, of building and creating these Islamic brigades. And today they go, they, they say, Colin Powell in the, in, the, in the United Nations Security Council will go in and say, we have to go after the terrorists, Saddam Hussein is is linking up with Osama bin Laden, their buddy buddies, and so on. The fact of the matter is that after September 11, on September 13th, when the head of Pakistan's ISI, General Mahmoud Ahmad, uh, was invited into the State Department to negotiate the terms of Pakistan's cooperation in the war on terrorism, uh, he negotiated with Colin Powell and Richard Armitage. There were meetings held behind closed doors on the 12th and the 13th of September with uh, the head of Pakistan's inter-services intelligence. Yet at the same time, 
the Bush administration knew, the FBI knew, the CIA knew, that this same individual was behind the transfer of money to the terrorists, as confirmed by an FBI report published in late September. They, they also knew of the historical link between the ISI and the terrorists. Obviously, they knew because they're behind it. The CIA is, is at the pinnacle of this of this relationship, CIA, ISI, um, Al-Qaeda. That understanding, I think, is crucial. In an, in an anti-war uh, movement, we have to understand that the main political actors are criminals. They are war criminals, but they're involved in a process of deceit using the, the instruments of intelligence, uh, presenting the war on terrorism as an objective of, of U.S. foreign policy when in fact they are the architects of, of these terrorist organizations. It's not simply going into the streets and saying I'm against the war, please get out of Iraq. The way to organize an anti-war movement, the way you do that is to show that these people are criminals in the eyes of public opinion. And you reverse the consensus. The consensus is that the Bush administration is a legitimate government. It uh, has made mistakes. It may uh, have acted uh, on the foreknowledge that uh, something might have happened on 9-11, but uh, there were failures and lapses and so on. That's the, that's the kind of consensus which is unfolding. I don't think that... that uh, public opinion or even the anti-war movement is saying that this administration, these people should be arrested, okay? And they should be arrested in terms of their own legislation, their own laws that they are themselves enacting. If U.S. public opinion were to understand that the Bush administration is complicit that the Bush administration was involved in acts of camouflage, that the Bush administration is responsible for the deaths of the people uh, on September 9-11, 2001, the whole process would collapse like a deck of cards. The, the, the leaders behind this agenda would not have a leg to stand on. But we must... We must not fall into the trap of revealing the links of a handful of individuals within the Republican Party or the Bush administration, when in fact the complicity is much broader. So the fact that, that successive uh, administrations, Clinton, Bush, have supported Al-Qaeda, uh, that this is on record, should constitute the basis for leading an anti-war movement which will then discredit the leaders to the extent that meaningful changes can occur in the, in the fabric of U.S. society, the fabric of the state apparatus, uh, in, the, in the role of the corporations. An anti-war movement has to be coupled with an anti-globalization movement. We're not dealing with separate, with separate processes. We have to understand that that, uh, that dollarization, uh, free trade, as defined by the World Trade Organization, or under the Free Trade Area of America's project, is part of this, of this broader agenda of, of military conquest. As far as the FTAA is concerned, there's a concurrent and parallel military cooperation agreement between 30, 28 countries of the hemisphere, uh, which in a sense is, the, is, the, is, is uh, being negotiated alongside the FTAA. It's important to understand the FTAA is part of the national security agenda. And Mr. Zelik, uh, who, is, who is responsible as trade negotiator for the Bush administration, is himself a member of the national security team. The veto that 
to the resolution of the United Nations suggests that the Bush administration uh, is criminal because uh, they, in, they have upheld within the highest body of the United Nations the right of Israeli of the Israeli authorities to kill Arafat. So they have endorsed within the UN framework the idea of political assassination, that if you don't like a political leader, you kill him. This decision of the United States um, in, the, in the United Nations Security Council to veto a resolution which condemns the assassination or the proposed assassination of Yasser Arafat ultimately uh, grants legitimacy to Ariel Sharon. It's in fact the green light that he can go ahead and do it. Okay, he can go ahead and kill Arafat, uh, and uh, the United States will support him. This uh, diplomatic stance, because it's within the arena of the United Nations, is not very intelligent. Okay? Perhaps a, a democratic administration might have proceeded otherwise. Okay? In, in other words, uh, they, they might say, well, let's get rid of Arafat, but we don't need to make it public. We don't need to plaster it on the tabloids that we're in favor of killing him. Okay? Uh, that, that is the nuance maybe between a Republican administration and a Democratic administration. This administration uh, is not particularly good in, in uh, international diplomacy. It, it, it states its agenda very clearly. It says, ah, oh, we don't like this guy, we'll go out and kill him. Okay? Um, he's a threat to America, let's go and kill him. He's, uh, he, uh, he's a threat to peace in the Middle East, let's kill him and, and ensure continuity. It's under Clinton administration, they would have said, uh, they said yes, we, we uh, support Shaman Arafat, and then they send in the CIA, and the CIA kills him off. What I'm trying to say is that this administration on the surface is, 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 looks really bad, uh, because it advertises how bad it is to public opinion, and it, it, it makes the statement within the United Nations. But I don't think the choice is to have if we go in for, for, for regime rotation in America and we get a new government and the new government is, is not quite as explicit in terms of its plans to assassinate uh, um, heads of state that they don't like or leaders that they don't like, well, that, that we've actually achieved something in, 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 uh, you know, in the realm of, of, uh, of progress or humanity. The loyal opposition is, in fact, not an opposition, because the loyal opposition is committed, ultimately, to maintaining the status quo with regard to the American system of government and the American corporate agenda. Uh, it doesn't question uh, the, the, the fact that Wall Street uh, can take over health services and, uh, and education, uh, that uh, the main thrust of 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 the of the U.S. economy is is the weapons industry. That uh, civilian um, activities are being uh, destroyed uh, with a view to beefing up the military-industrial complex, producing nuclear weapons, and so on and so forth. It doesn't ultimately get to the core. Of, of, uh, of, uh, of the American system of government and the American um, economic social system or American capitalism. Um, and I think that is the, I think that's the main weakness of this anti-war agenda. It doesn't disarm the system. It doesn't create the basis for disarming the system. It is also very much um, based on on dramatic uh, one-day uh, public events, big rallies. So on a particular day, everybody goes to the streets, and it's a ritual in a sense. 
They go to the streets, and the, the objective of the organizers is to maximize the number of people who are out there. The objective is not necessarily to disarm the, the, anti, the, to disarm the war agenda. Okay? Um, and I think what we have to do is certainly continue with major public events, but build local-level committees which spread across America in neighborhoods, in parishes, in, in workplaces, that these will then constitute the basis of a, of a genuine opposition where alternatives are debated, where, where, the, where the war agenda is debated, where the legitimacy of the system is, is discussed, where information is, is, is transmitted. We have to, uh, we have to uh, weaken the propaganda apparatus. We have to have a system of, inf of alternative information which will inform our fellow citizens as to what is happening in the world because when they read newspapers or when they look at television, they get a particular stylized version of events which never questions the legitimacy of, of uh, of the main political and military actors. It constitutes the basis for at least reversing the tide and disarming the war agenda.